It's better to have no deal than a bad deal. And I'll tell you why. All right, so now you found a distributor who you like and trust, and you have to negotiate what I call a fair distribution deal. So I use the word fair because it's got to be reasonable to both parties. You as the producer, you have to feel like you're getting the correct deal and the distributor, they also have to feel like they're getting the correct deal. So that is what I call fair. When both sides feel a little bit compromised, but they both feel comfortable in doing the deal. That's how you know it's what I call a fair deal. All right, so let's talk about some of the terms of a fair deal. Generally speaking, the reason that distribution and distributors have such a bad reputation is because they give really bad lopsided deals in their favor, and then they don't even honor those deals. So a lot of distributors are guilty of that. Um, Most distributors start with a really, really lopsided deal that favors them more so than the producer, the filmmaker. So, and some of the things that you have to be aware of in a distribution deal are, and in no particular order. One is the length of the term. So a lot of distributors look for say seven to 10 years to represent your film exclusively. I think that's way too long. Um, I don't mind giving a seven year term, but I would break it up into two, two, and three, or three, two, and two. So the first term is three years, then two years renewal, then another two year renewal. And you could give it as a seven year term because we're going to talk about what we call performance thresholds in a second, which would terminate if they don't hit certain levels. All right. So giving seven years is fine as long as you have outs after year three, year five, and then, you know, it goes to year seven. So a performance threshold is something that basically you say to the distributor, sure, I'll give you seven years, but if after year three, you have not hit a certain amount of revenue, or you haven't returned to me, say in a producer report, um, what we call producer share, um, say $100,000 worth of producer share by the end of year three, then I, the filmmaker, have the option to terminate that deal because you're not performing at the level that you said you were gonna perform at. And you know, the distributor might say, well, it was market conditions, it's this and this, that. And you say, I know, well, that's why we put that condition in is because if you don't, deliver at that level, it's my option. Now, as the filmmaker, you don't necessarily have to exercise that option, but it's good to have the option because let's say after three years of them handling your film exclusively, they've delivered nothing, zero or or a hundred dollars. And you're sitting there and you just made this film and you put your heart and soul into it and all your money and resources and you've gotten a hundred dollars after three years or nothing, you're disappointed. Can you imagine how you feel if you got to wait it out another four years, seven years or 10 years, that's what aggravates filmmakers the most. So build in these performance thresholds or do the other way to do it is say, start with a three-year term that automatically renews for another two years if they hit $100,000 in revenue and another two years thereafter. And that gives the distributor the seven years that they want, but they have to meet certain criteria to trigger that. So that's what I call fair. The distributors hate that. They hate when you hold them to a certain standard, but I say, hey, you're the distributor. You're supposed to be selling. You say you're good at selling. If you're so good, then, you know, why can't you guarantee that you're going to hit these certain, you're not even guaranteeing it. I'm saying if you don't hit it, then I have the option to maybe try something else. Okay. I think that's super important. Um, The biggest complaint I get from filmmakers, producers, is that they get tied up in these long deals and make no money for such a long period of time. Not to say that somebody else is going to do a better job, but at least you have the option to try somebody else because maybe this distributor didn't, you know, pay attention to your movie. Number two, this is something that everybody dreams of, and it used to be the case, but it doesn't exist anymore. It's called a minimum guarantee. Basically saying to the distributor, If you believe in my movie and you want to handle it exclusively for seven years, then how about giving me some money up front against the money that you're hopefully going to pay me down the road? And that's called a minimum guarantee, otherwise known as an advance. An advance and a minimum guarantee are a little bit different. An advance is an advance against royalties that they would otherwise pay you. And if they give you an advance and they don't earn those royalties, then legally, the way the advance is set up is you owe owe it back to them. All they're doing is advancing it to you. But if you didn't earn it, your film didn't earn it, then technically you would have to pay it back to them. But advances now are treated the same as minimum guarantees, meaning no matter what they earn, at the very least, this is the lowest amount they're going to give you. This is the minimum 
guaranteed amount that they're going to give you. So I call it a minimum guarantee now. So you try to get as much as possible. Lately, and I mean lately in the last three to four years or five years, uh, it's been very difficult to get minimum guarantees on low budget indie films. And that's because distributors don't want to take a chance at not making that money back. Um, if the film doesn't sell, then they will have committed, let's say, $50,000 to you in a minimum guarantee, and they're on the hook for it. And they say, why should they take the risk? And you say, because I'm the filmmaker, I took a risk with, say, $250,000 to make this low-budget indie film, and I'm only asking you to come in at $50,000. So this is a real contentious conversation. And I think that as a filmmaker, you have to ask for a minimum guarantee, and hopefully your distributor will believe enough in your film to say, we, we think we can do it. Now, here's the ironic part of this whole minimum guarantee conversation. The reason you're going to go with a distributor is because they tell you, they generally tell you, we're the best. We know exactly what we're doing. We've sold 500 movies like this in the past over the last 20 years. We go to every market. We know exactly what we're doing and we're going to do it so well. And that's why you should give us your film exclusively for 10 years. And you say, that's great. I want to deal with the best. I'm so glad that you're the best because that's who I want to be representing my film. And then you say, so if you're the best, what do you think the film will generate in the next 10 years, let's say? They said, we think we could generate half a million dollars in revenue. And you say, I mean, you're the best. You have a ton of experience. So how conservative is that estimate? They say, you know, it's, it's pretty conservative. We would love to do a million dollars, but we think a half a million dollars is realistic. So then you say, okay, I got an idea. You think you're going to generate a half a million dollars in revenue. All right, you're going to say, let's take a 30% distribution fee plus cost. So it's 150,000 in fees plus say another $50,000 in cost. So you're going to return to me $300,000. That's going to be my share of the revenue. Let's say, let's just be even more conservative. Say $250,000 is going to be the producer's share of the half a million dollars, right? Because your costs are going to be outrageously high. So they say, yeah, that's very conservative. And you say, okay, here's my idea. If you're so confident, you guys have sold 500 films like this in the past, you've been in business for 20 years, you know exactly what you're doing, you go to every market, you're the best. How about giving me half of that up front as a minimum guarantee? Half of it, not all of it. Even though that's a conservative estimate and you believe you're going to sell that no problem with your eyes closed, and you might double that. Give me half of your conservative estimate. Give me $125,000 up front, which is half of what you really believe you're going to generate for me. They're going to look at you like this. You're kidding me, right? They're gonna, every distributor is going to say, are you out of your mind? Like, why would we do that? And you're going to say, the reason you would do it is because you just finished telling me that you're the best distribution company, that you know exactly what you're doing, that you believe in my movie, and that you can sell it at that level. I'm just using your words, and I'm telling it back to you. They say, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? I say, well, why would I use you as a distributor if this and this and this? You either know what you're doing or you don't know what you're doing. Yes, the market can change. Yes, there's going to be ups and downs and blips and everything like that. But you guys are experts at what you do, and you're telling me that this is a conservative estimate. So this is the conversation that goes on. And at the end of the day, if you get $50,000 minimum guarantee based on the numbers that I just use, you're doing really, really well. All right? Chances are they're going to not want to give you a minimum guarantee, and they're going to say, thanks a lot. Go find another distributor. So this is the most contentious part of any distribution deal. And I believe that a minimum guarantee is important for two reasons. One is it incentivizes the distributor to really pay attention to your movie because now all of a sudden they have some financial risk, albeit a fraction of what you had. You just spent a quarter million dollars on your movie. They're going to spend $50,000. So at least they have, it's what I call the pay attention amount. So they have $50,000 invested and they need to pay attention if they want to get that money back because they're going to be out in first position anyway. So it's not that big a deal to get that money back if they're doing what they're supposed to do, which is sell your, your film. And the second reason is, is that you, the filmmaker, um, if they, this is a way of showing the distributor showing you that they want to have a decent relationship with you, that they believe in you and that they know what they're doing. They're confident that your film is saleable. All right. So I guess it's the same thing I just said in, in different words. But 
if they if the distributor is truly a good distributor and truly knows what to expect, then it's fair to get a minimum guarantee, albeit it's super, super difficult these days. Everybody is shying away from it. And that's because it's tough to generate the revenue for the movies, which is a whole other discussion. All right. So that's what a fair distribution. Oh, sorry. That's the minimum guarantee. Okay. So some of the other important terms are you got to watch the costs. They're going to want to deduct as many costs as possible. So you can put a cap on the costs and you can say, you know, you guys can spend up to say t- 7% of the revenue you generate um, without my approval, without written approval from the producer. Otherwise, you have to, if you're going to spend in addition to that, you have to get written approval. So, for instance, if they're going to generate a half a million dollars, they can spend 37%, $35,000 in costs without your approval. But let's say they want to spend more, then they want to spend 75000 That's coming off of your end ultimately. So, you need to approve that. Another uh, thing would be the exclusive, non-exclusive. No distributor is going to work non-exclusively. Everybody wants exclusive rights. All right. Then we talked about the term. All right. So the other thing is the fee. The distributors generally want to work at a 30% fee. Some will ask for 35%. Some may even ask for 40 I mean, if they're giving you a minimum guarantee, they may ask for 50 It's crazy. Obviously, it's in your bench interest to for them to work on as little a fee as possible. That way more goes into your pocket, but they need to work on, you know, a decent fee. So 20 to 25%, I think is fair. They generally want 30%. It's not outrageous to give 30%. That's sort of the norm in the industry. All right. So when you add this all together and you do the deal, um, and there's obviously other things like delivery and, and you know, the stat, what I call the boilerplate clauses of a distribution deal. Um, you know, you're, you're responsible for any of the liability stuff. So you have to get E&O insurance and there is indemnifications and all this kind of stuff. So it is a good idea to have um, a lawyer. You don't necessarily have to hire a lawyer to negotiate these contracts because generally speaking, the distributor is going to give you their standard contract. You're not going to draft the contract as a filmmaker and give it to them. They're going to give you their standard contract. If you're comfortable, you can read it yourself and negotiate it, or you can get a lawyer or a consultant like me or somebody to read it over and say, hey, here's what I think is working. Here's what isn't working. So another component that you have to deal with is the rights that you're granting. And generally, you're going to grant all rights, meaning you know, all forms of transmission. So usually it's primarily streaming these days, it's digital rights, um, but it could also be television rights and, you know, any other theatrical, if you think that's a thing, um, DVD, if you still want to try to attempt to release in DVD, but the distributor is generally going to take all the rights. Another big thing you have to think about is the territory that you're going to give them. So you can give them, say, If you're in the United States, it would be domestic. It might be the U.S. only. It might be U.S. and Canada. It might be all English-speaking territories. It might be the world. It might be Europe. So basically, you can break down the territories and give them, the distributor, what you think is the territory that they specialize in. You don't want to be giving a distributor worldwide rights if you realize that they only have do business domestically in the United States and Canada. Um, because what they're going to do is they're going to sub-distribute to an international distributor and that's going to dilute your royalties back to you because it's going to be a fee to the international distributor and then they're going to take the your distributor is going to take a fee from what's left over. So you'll have paid two fees unless you, you know, decipher that in your contract. The last thing is languages. Um, You basically, the distributors basically want every language, although you might only have your film available in one language, say English. If you have multiple languages, they're going to probably want to release it in various languages, but you're going to likely be responsible for doing the dubs or the subtitles unless they do them and deduct them as a cost. Anyways, there's a lot of things to think about. The idea is is to, if you're not comfortable with reading the contract yourself, the, the first couple of pages more or less outline all the things that I talked about. And then beyond that are all the boilerplate clauses, which are the least legalese stuff, you know, all this stuff. We call them boilerplates because basically we take them from one contract and put them into another and another. They just get copied over and over. So it's like delivery and insurance and indemnification and all the stuff that you see in these long standard terms and conditions. So you might get a deal that is a contract that's two or three pages 
um, that outlines the pertinent stuff. And then it says, and here's the standard terms and conditions, and that could be 10 pages. So if you're comfortable with the deal terms, you might want to get a lawyer to review the rest of it and or a consultant like me who says, okay, this looks good or not. Um, Chances are it's going to be hard to change the standard terms and conditions because they just keep repeating themselves over and over and over again. It's the main terms and conditions that, that are negotiable for the most part. So that's a distribution deal in a nutshell, although there's obviously a lot more to it. Um, just one big, big word of advice. Don't take a bad deal. Too many filmmakers agree to sign a bad deal and they know it's a bad deal going into it because it's the only deal that they got offered. I am telling you from experience, primarily from other filmmakers, not my own, because I generally do my own distribution, but from other filmmakers, it's better to have no deal than a bad deal. And I'll tell you why. A bad deal ties your film up for say 10 years and you're not gonna see a penny over 10 years and there's nothing you can do about it. Whereas no deal means Although you don't have a deal, you're not represented yet, at least your film's still available for you to find a decent deal. So you ha there's a lot more work. You have to keep going through the process and looking for distributors and finding the right deal. But at least, look at, if you get a bad deal, you lament that every night you go to bed and you think about how bad this deal is and that you gave your baby away to the wrong parents um, for 10 years. And that is painful. Whereas if you don't have a deal, then it's like, wow, what am I, I, I don't have a deal. I got to do something. I got to get this into play. I got to, you know, start generating some, but at least you don't have the pain of knowing that you are tied up for 10 years with a bad deal. So just remember, don't take a bad deal. If you don't have to, it's better to have no deal. Cause at least you're still in play. Now, if you try and try and try, you know, over three, four five years, and you can't get any deal, but a bad deal. Then you got to make a decision. Do you want to take a bad deal? But at that point, I would say you should explore self-distribution over taking a bad distribution deal from a distributor. And I will talk about self-distribution in another video, but at least self-distribution puts you in the driver's seat to at least give yourself a chance that it's more viable potentially than having a bad distributor and a bad distribution deal.